Now, I say most importantly because the AFC united virtually the entire old right in a mass movement that gained the overwhelming sympathy of the American people, 72 percent of whom opposed entering the war on the eve of Pearl Harbor. Forged in the flames of a world at war, a, the loosely aligned politicians, resident intellectuals, and publicists who made up this movement began to cohere a fairly consistent set of ideas. The idea that war breeds tyranny and subverts Republican forms of government. The idea that America's role in the world is chiefly exemplary and that we were fighting National Socialism overseas only to witness its triumph on the home front. And central to it all, an acute consciousness of America's tragic destiny as an imperial power, doomed, like all the others, to degenerate into a parody of itself. Garrett Garrett, the journalist and sometime novelist and financial writer, typified this elegaic sensibility in his writings, particularly in the trilogy of essays on, on the New Deal, published as The People's Pottage. In Rise of Empire, the third essay, he gives voice to the old right's anger as well as their analysis of what went wrong with America. Quote, between government in the Republican meaning, that is constitutional, representative, limited government on the one hand, and empire on the other hand, there is mortal enmity. Either one must forbid the other or one will destroy the other. That we know, yet never has the choice been put to a vote of the people." End quote. The storm of abuse that streamed out of the White House aimed at the America Firsters was truly phenomenal. If you think George W. Bush and his fellow red state fascists were the first to tar their anti-war opponents as enemy agents and potential terrorists, then check the history books. The campaign conducted by the White House and the far left against the AFC, with the invaluable assistance of British covert agents, rivals in scope and sheer viciousness the smear campaign against the anti-war movement in our own day. With a membership of some 800,000 paid members and a brace of prominent individuals spanning the political spectrum, the America First Committee staged massive rallies, lobbied, and worked tirelessly to keep us from falling into the European vortex. As the war hysteria grew in the wake of Pearl Harbor, the pro-war forces, triumphant at last, demanded that prominent America Firsters be charged with sedition. Led by the Communist Party and its fellow travelers, this campaign nearly succeeded in indicting the entire leadership of, of, of the AFC, as well as members of Congress who had opposed the headlong rush to war. As it was a motley collection of some 30 or so individuals, including the brilliant uh, half-black intellectual Lawrence Dennis, were rounded up and charged with plotting a Nazi revolution in the U.S in what the prosecution characterized as, quote, a conspiracy of ideas, end quote. <laughs> Forced underground in the wake of Pearl Harbor, the old right persisted in the voluminous private correspondence of that tireless letter writer, Rose Wilder Wayne, in scattered circles of like-minded individualists and a few organizations and one-man propaganda outfits Libertarianism persisted like a subterranean river, periodically bursting up to the surface and disrupting the socialist interventionist consensus. Now, the swan song of the old right was the defeat of Senator Robert A. Taft at, at the hands of Dwight David Eisenhower uh, for the Republican nomination and the decimation of the ranks of the old right in Congress as well as in the media and the culture at large. Such stalwarts as John Flynn, who continued his radio program well into the 
late 1940s and churned out books at a record rate kept up the fight. In the dark days of post-war America, when the socialist interventionist consensus was virtually unanimous, a young Murray Rothbard regularly tuned in to Flynn's broadcasts. The, the Chicago inspiration, uh, the Chicago inspiration, the uh, Chicago Tribune was also an inspiration, his only sources of ideological inspiration and contact until he stumbled on the foundation for economic education, then the primary libertarian educational organization. A student of the famed Ludwig von Mises, whose, e whose uh, economic theories are the foundation of today's Austrian School of Economics, Rothbard is the bridge between the old right of the 1940s and the libertarian movement as it exists today. Now, I've told Murray's story in my book, An Enemy of the State, The Life of Murray and Rothbard, in which I perhaps overemphasize his role as a political activist at the expense of his monumental achievements as a scholar. I took this tack, I can see now, because Rothbard's life and career is really a narrative account of the decline and rebirth of the organized libertarian movement, a history spanning the period from the 1940s to the 1990s. Briefly associated with the Buckley Circle and even more briefly with the Ayn Rand cult, Rothbard's triumphs and travails mirror the ups and downs of a movement that could not have been more beleaguered and yet persisted against all odds to make a real impact on American political culture. Many commentators, mostly unfriendly, have remarked on Rothbard's apparent fickleness, his turns from left to right and back again, aligning with the conservatives and then the new left, and then the conservatives again, with several tactical twists and turns in between. However, this apparent inconsistency was no inconsistency at all, as a political, uh, since he maintained, correctly, I believe, that libertarianism as a political philosophy transcends the traditional left-right paradigm that so limits the parameters of the political imagination in this red state, blue state world. Rothbard wrote for National Review, where he was restricted to the economics beat but in private, there was conflict. In an exchange of letters with William Buckley, Rothbard dissented from the cold warrior fanaticism that animated the Buckleyite right. He was eventually convinced that the National Review crowd pined for a third world war in which they wouldn't hesitate to use nuclear weapons, in which case we were all cooked. Rothbard had thoroughly absorbed the so-called isolationism of Flynn and the old America Firsters, and had developed early on a libertarian perspective on the foreign policy question that was a logical extension of the non-coercion principle. Just as state violence against its own citizens was to be limited as much as possible, so it is desirable from a libertarian perspective to limit, isolate, and restrict states from engaging in in a coercion beyond their own borders. War, in the words of Randolph Bourne, is the health of the state, and the limited government and free market economics that are supposed to be the cardinal principles of American conservatism have been time and again betrayed on account of their worship of the war god to whom they owe their primary loyalty. Rothbard's break with the conservative movement and his sojourn into the new left occurred at a crucial juncture in American history, the tumultuous 1960s when war and repression of protest movements were the key issues of the day, a day not unlike our own, at least in certain respects. The Vietnam War was the focus of the national debate and the rising youth revolution coincided with this development giving libertarians an opportunity to bring the message of freedom to a wider audience than ever before. The war provided an opening for Rothbard and his growing circle to make an appeal to the left, and their journal, Left and Right,